Well, I was born into a very conservative Christian family, um, Baptist in fact, and uh, from a very early age the Bible was pumped into me. And uh, the result is today I can quote long passages of it <laughs> in the King James Version. And, uh, but that, in, in fact, even though I uh, balked at doing this, uh, it did uh, spark um, an interest in, in me uh, in the people, places, and the countries that uh, the Bible talks about. And um, I remember once, uh, I must have been just going on six years old, the National Geographic magazine uh, published a series of marvelous paintings by a man called Herge on life in ancient Egypt. It was 1941 that the article came out. And that's uh, kind of a benchmark for me. <laughs> From that point on, I was really interested in Egypt, uh, which is spoken of in the Bible quite frequently, of course. and. Um, and the biblical lands themselves. And uh, I can remember going through high school uh, with this interest still intact, uh, even though I've, uh, my teachers tried to dissuade me from making this a life career. <laughs>
Uh, I'm very, very lucky at uh, having been to Brown. But Polotsky, yes, um, uh, he had a, well, he had two courses to teach. Uh, one was um, the uh, Coptic, part of the Coptic Bible, um, the, in uh, Sahili, of course. And um, uh, so that was one of his courses, and it was very valuable because he had all sorts of uh, grammatical and syntactic insights. Um, but at the same time, each week he had a seminar, which was four hours long, about one o'clock to five o'clock. And um, at the beginning uh, of this, there were about, about seven or eight of us in the seminar. And uh, he would say, gentlemen, this is a seminar. He was a very, very old world Germanic kind of professor who uh, didn't tolerate any, any, any uh, hanky-panky or <laughs> anything of that sort. So he, um, he would say, gentlemen, this is a seminar. We're going to be discussing the syntax of the Coptic verb. And um, I want you all to participate. And then he would talk for four hours. Who was going to say anything? And then the next week he would come to us and say, gentlemen, this is a seminar and you did not contribute last week. Then he would talk for four hours straight. And no one, <laughs> no one would dare to interrupt him because the, uh, the jewels that were falling from his mouth, I mean, God. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was, it was great to sit at his feet. My notes are still there. I still have them, and they, uh, I can see how he, he operated. And he was a very honest scholar. He would, um, uh, <clears throat> he would expound for, in the four-hour <laughs> period. He would expound on one point, one or two points, and come up with a conclusion. And the next week, he might have come to us and said, everything I said last week is wrong. And uh, we'll have to, I forgot about so-and-so, and we'll have to factor that into the mix. And this was extremely honest, and um, I really appreciated that. I, I very, very much did. Um, Kaminos also was, uh, was very meticulous in, a, in, in his detail. And I remember him chastising the class, uh, well, there were only two of us in the class, but chastising us uh, for not having found a twelfth photograph of the Weni inscription, the old uh, Egyptian Weni inscription. There were twelve photographs that he knew of and we, we, were, we, we had found ten or eleven or something. You missed that twelfth one! He was very angry. <laughs> so, and uh, I took Demotic with uh, Dick Parker and uh, that was good. He, he too was a very honest scholar. If he didn't know something, he told you. So I, I, I valued that. Um, and Gigi Claire was very, very nice man. And uh, he taught me a lot about epigraphy. Well, so did Caminos. He was an epigrapher. And de Molinara, uh, with whom I struck up a, a very long standing uh, relationship that uh, came right on down to his death a few years ago. So. Um, and uh, it, it's too bad that that particular practice, well, I guess the money has run out. Uh, was not continued in exchanging uh, professors uh, with Europe. Uh, I, I know that, uh, that this is still done, of course it's still done, but um, Brown seemed to do it in a, a very a methodical way. It was all reasoned out who was going to be invited. And whatnot. I graduated in 1965 and um, got a job uh, at first it was a, a lectureship at Brown, but that didn't last very long, and I was invited to come back to my alma mater, uh, Toronto, and um, uh, teach Akkadian, <laughs> which uh, was not my forte, um, and also uh, Egyptian history. Um, but at the same time, uh, there was an awful lot of work being done in archaeology in Egypt and, and in the Middle East. and. Um, uh, some of the work was being funded, of course, and also contributed to by uh, people in the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum. In fact, Doug Tushingham, who was the uh, chief archaeologist there, was the deputy director of Kay Kenyon's uh, um, excavations at uh, Jerusalem. And um, it was uh, through that association that I was invited to be one of her little excavators and, uh, in 1964. And then for three years uh, following, I was invited back. So I was really lucky because 
uh, at the time she was the just the best there was maybe not now uh, all sorts of advances have been made in field archaeology but at that time um, I was very lucky to uh, you know to study under her and uh, to be assigned uh, a small unit uh, to, for excavation in Jerusalem in the old city <coughs> and um, uh, that really opened the door more than I can say um, because when I got to Egypt and I saw what uh, certain expeditions were doing who I'm not going to mention uh, <laughs> uh, they were really um, uh, 50 years behind the times and uh, uh, that uh, spurred me on well maybe there was a mission here or something <laughs> to bring light to the Gentiles or something <laughs> Later on in that decade, in 1970, that's right, um, largely through the prodding of some of my students, uh, I applied to, um, to get a grant to go and do some epigraphic work at Karnak. And uh, the little temple of Osiris Ekajet, Osiris Real of Eternity, is, uh, was what we chose and what the funding agency thought we were going to do, which we did. I mean, there was no uh, deception here. But um, the Department of Antiquities was a little puzzled at, at uh, why we were coming, and I hadn't followed the ropes, the uh, the rules at all in applying. And so <clears throat> this um, uh, didn't put a spanner in the works, but it, it made it a little more difficult to work at Osiris. Uh, but we patched up all of that and uh, stuck it out until 1972. And the manuscript, and it's a very good one, has not been published. I don't know the ins and outs of that, but um, uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, it was a kind of a baptism of fire. After that, because of my work with Akhenaten, uh, the University Museum in Philadelphia chose me to go over and see what was going on, uh, because uh, six and seven years had passed. Uh, on this project which was under their aegis and uh, no publications had come out <coughs> of any note so that uh, put me into this Akhenaten temple project uh, in what would it have been 1970 71 that's right and um, that lasted until 76 um, and we did quite a bit of work uh, we really did and uh, in 77 uh, the first volume came out which is a bit confusing uh, for a variety of reasons that I won't go into now, but at any rate, we did get a lot of material uh, published and out. And uh, then a second volume came a little later. Uh, but uh, the um, what I, I, I remember about the Akhenaten Project is that um, uh, we, um, uh, we have been matching uh, photographs of Talatat uh, and re reconstructing wall scenes, which was quite interesting, 807 wall scenes we, uh, we reconstructed. They haven't all been published yet, which is a, a great pity, um, but um, at any rate, uh, with all these wall scenes sort of, as it were, floating in air, <laughs> we didn't know how they articulated or where one stood as opposed to another and so forth. So the, um, the the great need at that point was excavation. Let's see what, where the foundations were, what the foundations looked like, and what we could do with that. And we were very lucky in, what, 76, that's right, January 76, to come upon uh, the wall, the southern, southern part of the first court of the Gempaaten Temple. And um, with all sorts of fragments still lying around that the, uh, the people who dismantled the building under Horam had, had not taken away. And so you you got blocks like this with parts of a scene, and we'd been working with these scenes so frequently, and so much. We, we just a trace of the relief. You could say, "Oh, that's that scene. That's that scene." And uh, the the upshot of the whole thing was that around a 60 meter um, extent of the wall, the southern wall. Um, we could, over that 60 meter uh, span, say that this type of scene was right here, next to it was this scene, next to it was the, 
we could have reconstructed the whole thing. And, um, uh, well, we could have, but the groundwater is, is lethal to, uh, you know, uh, and the, uh, if it wasn't protected from the sun, the color would have bleached out, and there was color as well. Um, so that still, uh, we worked through until 1991 and got the dimensions of the, uh, 210 meters wide, can you believe? Tremendous, big, gigantic temple, and maybe over 100 meters uh, east-west although that's debatable. <clears throat> but um, at any rate, uh, that, that still hangs fire, and uh, I, I don't know whether the Department of Antiquities wants us to go ahead. I've told them that it would mean the bleaching out of painted scenes and this sort of thing, and the, the rise of these uh, subsoil water and what that would do. So they've sort of drawn in their horns and maybe we'll just let it lie. Um, but the, the other thing that um, we began to realize is that uh, even though the ninth pylon at Karnak was the important one where, where a lot of Talatat had come from, the tenth pylon is equally important because there's a, a fragment there, uh, well a fragment, <laughs> a gigantic block like that, on which there are parts of the columns of a text of Akhenaten in which he apparently introduces his new god. And uh, if we penetrated deeper inside the tenth pylon, we undoubtedly would get additional blocks, you know, continuing that inscription. But the engineering problems of taking down the tenth pylon are enormous. I, well, 50 years ago when I was on it <laughs> for the first time, uh, they were mentioning 150,000 to do it, and now it's millions. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, we're working um, in uh, the Talatat at Karnak, uh, put me in touch with the Karnak area, certainly, and um, I became quite familiar with, uh, with the problems there, and uh, my um, relations with uh, certain national uh, expeditions like the French <laughs> was not um, uh, well. We cooperated and we uh, we had um, some good times together. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, living cheek by jowl with uh, other uh, expeditions, the Swiss, for example, Richard Fazzini down in in Moot. <laughs> uh, these are are. Uh, unless you actually build walls around your own concession, <laughs> uh, there's bound to be some conflict somewhere along the line. But that's life, and uh, who cares now? I don't care. <laughs> the French are doing a, a terrific job, I must say. They've got all the equipment to do it. <laughs> and I, I just wish uh, our country might uh, <laughs> contribute a little more. But that's <laughs> I suppose it was around 19, 1988 or 1989 that um, a number of us uh, who were working in Upper Egypt, uh, because of a, a feeling that uh, Lower Egyptian sites uh, might be gradually disappearing, um, were invited to take a, a Lower Egyptian site, uh, as well as the site they already had in Upper Egypt. And so, um, in 1988, that's, that's right, um, uh, my wife and I and a small, small boy uh, went on a kind of a shopping tour. <laughs> and, other, and when we got to Mendes, um, oh boy, <laughs> a spectacular sight, just unbelievable. And uh, so, we uh, <coughs> made an application to the Department of Antiquities and at that time, Sayed Tawfiq was uh, in the Director General. And um, just by luck, he and I had started off together with old Ray Smith <laughs> and had suffered together. And we were buddies. So um, uh, I put it to him and he said, absolutely, sign here. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, very fortunate. So um, we cooperated with uh, Doug Brewer and Rob Wenke for the first uh, four years, 
but they fell on hard times in about 1994 and uh, we were left with the site. So um, it was a totally different kind of excavation from Upper Egypt, from, from Thebes. Um, and at Thebes the stratification was very, very tight. You had to be very careful uh, in r removing the various uh, layers. But um, uh, at, uh, at Mendes, oh man, the, uh, the stratification was thick. And, and it was obvious, you could see it, the coloration was, uh, would change. And um, we right away uh, sort of uh, took three sites uh, at, uh, on the mound and uh, immediately we were into a sacred lake and um, uh, an area just south of the temple, priest's houses and this sort of thing. Um, so uh, we, we we plunged in and uh, we, we haven't, uh, well, the last season was 2014 when the troubles were really taking over and um, like many expeditions we, uh, we did not get our okay for four years. This year we've got it, but uh, it may be too late because my staff has just has fled and gone elsewhere. <laughs> So I may with Sue just have to uh, hold the fort for <laughs> for a month or so. <laughs> but uh, oh, well, if I um, Mendes is um, oh, it's a, it's a fantastic place. It really is because um, uh, I'm interested in how the textual record, not necessarily from the site, from all over Egypt, uh, mentioning Mendes. Uh, can be fitted into the archaeological picture, and it really can. It's very exciting. Um, there's a, uh, well, the very names of parts of the site that have lingered on uh, among the locals today. Uh, we were digging an area, uh, which is actually turned out to be the Northwest Harbor. Um, there's an awful lot of water in, in those days. <clears throat> there are harbors and canals all over the place. and. Um, so uh, this Northwest Harbor was lacustrian clay and, uh, and, and a nice cutoff point in the, in the pottery. And um, uh, we had a hard job to convince the inspector that we really did have a harbor uh, until it was proved to him, uh, <coughs> of course. But um, uh, then the lo some of the locals came along and said, well, yes, we, all, we knew that a long time ago. Uh, the area that you were digging is called in Arabic the Lake of Crocodiles. So, <laughs> so you're right. You have been digging in a, in a lake. <laughs> and uh, there's another part of the site, a very large part, called the uh, Hill of Bones, Komal Adam. And lo and behold, you go walk up on it. And yeah, there are bones there. So, uh, a necropolis or or what? I mean, it's uh, uh, that that, that uh, augurs. I don't know. It was partly dug by uh, an anthropologist uh, from out west uh, who's now long since gone. But she reports in her sounding that she went down through identifiable layers from uh, Roman times right through to uh, just about the 7th century BC uh, when uh, she uncovered masses of skeletons uh, articulated and one on top of the other and arranged like this and it dates to around 700 and isn't it interesting that Isar Haddon mentions three cities that he uh, unloaded on as an object lesson uh, Tanis, Sais and Mendes and he had mountains of skulls outside the gates and all this kind of stuff and just at that level, we have all these skeletons. Boy, if, if <laughs> anyhow, this uh, I'm slavering at, the <laughs> at this point because I, I know I probably won't live to see it. But uh, it'd be awfully nice to devote the rest of my life to this site. And and we're we're only scratching the surface. Um, the whole southern half of the site seems to be industrial, with great ovens and kilns and things like that. And, uh, well, there are industrial archaeologists, I know, so I'd have to get one of those. Uh, and then, oh yes, just a, 
as though that weren't enough, um, we dug outside the temple. The last uh, extension of the temple was under Amasis in the Sei dynasty. And um, uh, we put a sounding down just outside the temple going west. And almost immediately we were in a, a first intermediate period. And then for five meters, can you believe, five meters down, Old Kingdom, third millennium, and n not interrupted by anything, continuous, all the strategy. And uh, at the top were ceilings of Pepe the Second, a beautiful Pepe the Second seal. And at the very bottom, five meters down, ceilings of the First Dynasty. Aha. Can you believe? And I know there are more there. Oh, that's going to be a treasure trove. The whole North Sinai was going to be canalized, turned into uh, farmland, and it would uh, take, they were going to do it in strips, um, five strips of about 20 kilometers broad each, and they would be done in two to three, each of them in two to three years. So that would be 30 or something like that. All the land uh, to the Israeli border would be fertile or would have canals in it and it sounded like a frightfully ambitious uh, business uh, I don't know if you've ever been out to the Sinai but the you know the sand dunes are everywhere and it's, I can't see them doing it at any rate um, uh, I went up there and uh, uh, said that um, it would be fine if we could uh, get a, a contract for uh, Tel Kedwa <coughs> and um, they, they seem, oh, that's no problem, no problem, sign here. So we signed and, and uh, then put ourselves in their hands. And uh, uh, an inspector was assigned who did everything for us. I really did. He, um, he, he uh, rented a house. Uh, he rented a cook. Uh, he had uh, vehicles put at our disposal. And uh, we went out to the site each day from this house. And, uh, oh, the, the, the North Sinai is the Wild West, it really is. Uh, we were only in residence for two, three weeks and uh, found out that our landlord was a drug dealer. Yeah, and everybody knew it, apparently. <laughs> but the, uh, after that first year, when we came back the second year, we wanted to rent the same house. Oh, you can't. Why? Well, the landlord's dead. <laughs> he had been arrested and executed. <laughs> so um, anyway, we, we did occupy that same house <laughs> and we could go up to the roof and it was very, really pleasant in, in a way. And um, so, but every morning we would have to travel to the site using the edges of the canals that were in process of being, of being excavated. And uh, when we come, uh, maybe two mornings later, you'd find that 20 more meters had been canalized. <laughs> and uh, so we had to go along the, the tops of the embankments, and then at certain points cross over and go you know, this way and zigzag all over. Finally, we would get to Tel Kedwa, which was on the site of the old British road between uh, Egypt and Palestine in the old days. And uh, <clears throat> It was a, a huge site, two, uh, 220 meters square, and um, uh, it had eroded in such a way that it had leveled the entire site of the fort. The, the fort was 200 meters square, and um, uh, leveled it. Uh, the, the wind from the north is constantly blowing, and so what you would do in the morning when, the, when it was moist and the dew was on the ground, just look over, you could see the edges of the wall coming along, and then the corner. And, then, and you could trace this all the way around. And from the air, it made a marvelous uh, picture, because you, the, you could see the discoloration in the sand. And um, the inspector wanted us to not only excavate this area, but actually to rebuild the fort. <laughs> Can you imagine uh, the number of bricks? Where would we get the, the soil for the bricks? So anyway, we dissuaded him about that, but uh, uh, oh, it was great. Uh, we were among the Bedou, and I learned how they bake bread uh, in, in, the, in the sand, uh, which is kind of interesting. And uh, they're excellent excavators, I must say. 
Uh, but we we had five, uh, was it? Yeah, five uh, seasons at Kadwa, and uh, we only touched the the northwest corner, yeah, northwest corner, and a point midway along the the, the northern wall. We didn't touch the. Uh, we had a Vietnam uh, veteran with us, Larry, and uh, he wandered around the site all over the place. And he came back one day and said, uh, "Don't touch that uh, north east corner." He said, "There are a lot of anti-personnel mines there." <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, we didn't. <laughs> but uh, it, it is a uh, a fascinating area. We didn't find uh, any inscriptional material, <laughs> uh, nor did Eliezer Oren, my colleague from Beersheba, before me. He didn't find, I don't believe, any uh, inscriptional stuff. But uh, it, it, it's a very, very interesting area, and uh, well, I guess it's going to be off limits for the next little while. Well, that came out of my interest in the Bible, of course. <laughs> And uh, uh, I, I became uh, interested in, well, the, the, the first thing was the Joseph story, which uh, intrigued me. Uh, it was, uh, I, I think, really the best Hebrew in the Bible. It really is a magnificent story. <clears throat> and so I, uh, I read that when I was a Hebrew teacher with the class uh, for a long, long time, and um, uh, then published a book on it. But uh, that sparked my interest in uh, Egyptian Canaan relationships, and um, uh, I, I became interested in the reign of Thomas III, uh, among others, and his great place name list, the top of list that he's left behind. At least the first one. The second one takes us into North Syria. Even though we tried, <laughs> uh, uh, when was that? Seventy-eight, no, seventy-nine. We. Um, uh, my wife and I uh, made a special trip to Damascus to contact the Department of Antiquities there to see whether they would um, allow us and, in fact, accompany us on um, uh, trips to see if we could plan out these top toponym lists. Were they just helter-skelter, the names, or did they follow a pattern? Were they uh, um, uh, roots, in fact? And um, they were all set to do it. Uh, oh, I, we really got acceptance from the uh, D Damascus uh, people. But then we couldn't do it for other reasons. And um, about a little later in 1981, I guess it was, we got um, accepted by the Department of Antiquities of Jordan. And um, uh, I took a small group of what, four, four people over there to actually walk out the King's Highway, and uh, to see what problems there would be in uh, retracing this ancient highway, uh, which I had a suspicion underlay an 11 name group of places uh, that were mentioned in sequence in, in the uh, Thutmose Third List. And <clears throat> so we started, <laughs> and uh, live and learn, it was um, uh, a very nice kind of Jordan is marvelous, um, and it's dry, and um, uh, so we we had a, a good time walking from site A to site B and identifying it and and how many kilometers was that and could it be done in a single day in ancient times and yes most of these places were about one day's march apart, so that um, that was exciting, um, but then. I was uh, keen to go as the crow flies. If point A is directly north of point B, we should be going in a straight line. Oh no, because in intervening was a wadi. And these wadis in Jordan are kind of precipitous. They go up and they... <laughs> and we were walking from this one site to the next and we're never getting there. <laughs> it wasn't appearing and we were exhausted. And it was noon and it was really hot. And if it hadn't been for our inspector, <laughs> we might have died of thirst out there. But uh, he rescued us. And then we realized that the ancients knew what they were doing. Their road had taken the top of the wadis. Even though it looked a little longer, it wasn't. And um, so 
that governed uh, uh, us from then on. But we would, uh, that was great. I enjoyed that. We had a big uh, Land Rover and uh, we would sleep in fields uh, <laughs> under the full moon. It was really great. Uh, I, I'd love to go back and do some more of that kind of surveying. No, I t uh, taught uh, at Brown for a couple of years, way, way back, and uh, then at Toronto, um, and then uh, sabbaticals at Ben Gurion uh, University, and um, also a couple of years at UPenn uh, in the 90s, that's right, and now at this place. And um, I, uh, I've been teaching language more than anything because that's what I'm in, very interested in, but also in history. And um, in the old days when I first started, uh, they, they give me anything to teach, <laughs> uh, like the uh, history of Mesopotamia, um, which I didn't relish. In. And then on one occasion I uh, taught the, uh, the ancient Near East in the Ro Roman period down to the coming of Islam. But mainly I've been teaching the history of Egypt and then introductory, well, all five phases of the language, uh, including Demotic and Coptic. And uh, at Toronto, we really had a program. <coughs> um, we don't have one here. And of course, at uh, UPenn, they had a, a program quite similar to Toronto. So um, I, I guess I've been more influenced by the way Polotsky approached things. Um, he had an awful lot of material in his head and knew when to introduce it and, and bring it forward. And uh, the students had to be bright enough to catch on what he was doing. <laughs> he wasn't going to wait for them, you know. Um, and I, I guess I, I have the same feelings that... Uh, and yet now um, I'm teaching more and more the introductory, introductory Middle Egyptian. and. Um, that, uh, well, I, I, I don't think kids are really uh, interested in language anymore. <laughs> and uh, to me, it's the very uh, nitty gritty of, of what we're doing with, without uh, proper translations of texts. The archeology, span I think, lags behind. <laughs> As, uh, I have a close friend, he, actually he lives around here, Bill Deaver, who's a famous, well, you probably know Bill, yeah, and uh, I once said to him, you know, Bill, uh, how did I put it? <laughs> uh, a single text is worth a thousand pots, or something <laughs> like that, <laughs> which he didn't like very much. <laughs> but uh, so I, I, in the old days, I tried to uh, combine what we were doing in, in class with uh, yearly, um, yearly. Uh, expeditions to Egypt, to take the students to Egypt, uh, graduate students, uh, for, uh, you know, maybe six months or, or even 12 months, and uh, take them around to the sites and, and uh, iron out various problems, usually linguistic problems, and uh, they, they all enjoyed it. I, I really uh, had um, quite a good deal of success. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know the the name James Hawk, his grammar of Middle Egyptian, which came, came out and actually is is uh, similar to uh, Jim Allen's. They both know each other; they're very close. Um, so uh, he was uh, one of my students, and um, Leprahan was one of my students, and uh, Ed Meltzer. I don't know if you know Meltzer. Yeah, he was as well, and. Uh, so, uh, with, with the Akhenaten Temple project also uh, available to these students, they, they would uh, help me out uh, in, in that when they, uh, <coughs> when they went to Egypt. Um, but I guess I, I don't really have any uh, philosophy of, of teaching. If they, if they want what I have to give, that's okay. If they don't, they can <laughs> do something else. <laughs> Right now, um, and this is, I guess, the last thing I'll be doing, we have uh, a second volume of the, uh, the work on uh, Mendes coming out, 
but um, I've always um, wanted to parallel my work in um, uh, in history and, and language with translations of texts. And uh, some years ago, the, the uh, oh, about 12 years ago now, uh, the students uh, virtually demanded that I put all my notes online. Oh gosh. So uh, <clears throat> I said, well, rather than that, I'm going to write a book and I'll write a history of Egypt on the basis of my notes, <laughs> which I did. And uh, Kendall Hunt of Dubuque, Iowa published it. And uh, then uh, I promised uh, Dubuque that, uh, or Kendall Hunt, that uh, I would uh, provide them with a uh, <clears throat> a set of translations, uh, historical texts, uh, backing up the statements in the history. And uh, I started about two years ago, <laughs> belatedly, uh, doing it, and now it's blossomed into something I never imagined. Uh, it's uh, already up to its third volume, and uh, it's going to be five or six volumes when I'm finished. So that'll be the last thing I do, I'm, I'm sure. But it's a lot of fun because I, I, I'm reading texts that I never have read before. And um, I have a, a, an idea, I, I think it's right, um, that in textual sources, especially public steely, triumph steely, and that kind of thing, um, you can, if, if you really get right down to the syntax, the grammar, choice of vocabulary, you can uh, sense the idiolect of the king. And I think it makes eminent sense. Um, not for some of the ghost-written stuff, because that's uh, formulaic, but uh, where, for example, say the first. <laughs> Holy cow! Uh, he's a very, very intense writer. Um, he doesn't stand for any nonsense whatsoever, and he's very direct in, in his syntax. Ramsay II is kind of water, he, he waters down his father uh, in, in many respects. Uh, he's a, maybe a little more sensitive. I don't know, but I, I'm getting a kind of a personal relationship with these kings <laughs> that I never would have thought. And, uh, that's kind of neat. That that would be a very good thesis. The idiolect of the empire pharaohs. Wow. <laughs>